And they cannot understand this idea because the most widely held view is God will himself personally execute and destroy. It's worse than that. He will torture for eternity those who turn him down. Is that true? Who do you suppose loves to have people believe that? Jesus came to die the death of a sinner. And all it says is that he was given up. And we know from Hosea, and we know from Romans 1, that's what God does. He sadly gives us up. But how does he feel as he gives us up? From Hosea, he cries, why will you die? How can I give you up? How can I let you go? Did Jesus know he was being given up? Remember in the Gospels, as he hung on the cross, did he cry, Why are you beating me up? Why are you torturing me? Why are you killing me? Why are you giving me up? Why have you forsaken me? The same thing. Because as Philippians says, if we could bring another letter in, Jesus emptied himself. He did not use these powers. He died as a sinful human. And what did God do to the Son? In the Gospels, remember, we discussed this. As all Christian evangelists have, have said through the years, and they're right, if we want to know the truth about God, and most of all what he does to those who turn him down, we should go to the cross and watch a sinner die. Not from old age or execution, but die as sinners will die at the end. And listen very carefully and watch very closely. Did God torture his son to death? Well, now there is also not only the experience of separation. We've cut ourselves off from God. and We cannot live without our Creator and all of that which is dwelt on in Scripture. But there is the fire of Peter. He says the very elements will melt with fervent heat. For sinners cannot live in the presence of the glory of God and survive. God said to Moses, no man can see my face and live. Now a legalist would say, that means if I catch you peeking, I'll kill you. But in the natural order of things, we who are out of harmony with God cannot live in the indescribable power and glory of his presence. We would be consumed. And uh, we've discussed this before, and there's so much of it that runs through scripture. Well then, if Jesus was demonstrating how the wicked will die at the end, why was he not consumed? Why was he not exposed to the glory of God? Or was he just a few hours before? On the Mount of Transfiguration, he stood in the unveiled glory of his Father, and he was not consumed. And maybe God chose to do it that way to show that the one who went out to die the death of a sinner was absolutely perfect. For had he been in any way out of harmony with his Father, he would have been consumed on the Mount of Transfiguration. I, I like to ask myself, God, consummately skillful teacher that you are, what are you trying to say here by doing it this way? Now, does the death of Christ accomplish all that needs to be done by his simply being given up and dying in such agony that the pain of crucifixion was hardly felt? In fact, he died long before you normally die from crucifixion, terrible as that is. But he seemed to be much more concerned about his relationship with his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he died so quickly from that experience and you remember when they saw the spear was thrust in his side, they couldn't believe he was already dead. And the evidence there that this was unique, totally different. But he rose on Sunday. And we discussed this before. If he died to pay the price of sin, what is the price of sin? To die for a day? Or to die in exquisite agony and rise on Sunday? Or is it to die and stay dead? forever. Or if you believe in, in hell, the wages of sin is to go to hell and suffer for eternity. If Jesus died to pay the price of sin, he should either be, depending on your understanding of things at the end, he should be writhing in the flames for eternity, or he should be staying dead forever, and he rose on Sunday. And remember he ascended to heaven, his triumphal return. Did they say, look, hurry back, you're supposed to be paying the price of sin. Or had he answered the questions and the great controversy about the righteousness and the justice and the love of God? Who said God had lied about death being the result of sin? And who loves to picture God as the executioner and the torturer of his wayward children? Was this all answered by the way Jesus died? And 
Once he'd answered the question, why stay dead any longer? In fact, Romans 4.25 says he was raised for our justification. He was raised on Sunday to continue with the work he'd been doing before. When he left his son, he perished. But the universe, never having seen death, would have misunderstood and served him from fear that God has said, obey me or I'll kill you, just as I killed Satan and his followers. That's in Patriarchs and Prophets at the beginning, the beginning of the whole great controversy. Then in Desire of Ages, the chapter, it is finished. Based on Jesus' words when he died, it's finished. I've cleared it all up. I know I have. At the end of the chapter, she says, now when God leaves the wicked to reap the natural results of their sin and they die, no one will misunderstand and serve God from fear because they have seen the death of the wicked in his son. He made himself to be sin. Nobody else has died that death. Nobody ever has died that death. And the universe looking on got the message. Yes, when God leaves a sinner to reap the natural results of his sin, he dies. But you do not need to serve me from fear because of that. That person is being sadly left to reap the results. Don't be afraid of me. I'm your heavenly father. Physicians don't kill their patients. I mean, the patient's dying already. Why do you need to kill him? Left alone, we all will die. Why would God kill his dying children? It's just if we don't trust him enough to let him heal us, then all he can do is let us go and we will die. And how this changes one's relationship from, with God. Now we offer him the obedience that springs from faith and there's no fear in this thing. Reverence to be sure. But we don't obey from a sense of obligation merely because we're required to do so. We do what's right because it is right. First John is going to say, when we did John, we look back in First John, there is no fear in love. Fear has to do with punishment, not worship. Perfect love casts out all fear. The cross should eliminate the obedience that springs from law and fear and lead us to the obedience that springs from love and trust and an understanding that God is not well served when we obey him from fear. Which one of us likes to have his children obey from fear because they're scared? Well, it might bring order in the home for a while, but when we're gone, that isn't going to last any longer, is it? Only if we've led our children to do what's right because it is right, will they go on doing it after we're gone? And God wants his children to do what's right whether he's watching or not, whether he keeps a record or not. You see, if God is the destroyer of the wicked, think of him resurrecting the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah to get it a little more. Can you imagine the Sodomites looking around and saying, here we go again. What good would that do the inhabitants of Sodom? Doesn't teach them a thing. Then who's benefited? The family looking on. Then how does God wish to be served? It would militate against the whole thing. My understanding is the reason why the wicked are raised, and Revelation makes it plain, doesn't it? Revelation 20, the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. Why would God resurrect the wicked? Why not leave them dead? Do you want to see them resurrected? God does resurrect the wicked. Is it because, as we've read through book by book, God has indeed terminated the lives of millions of his children? How about in the flood? How about the 185,000 Syrians? How about Lot's wife? How about Koradath and Abiram? Nadab and Abihu? Uzzah? Think of all the ones. And I believe, of course, if we believe, if we're right about the nature of man, they fall asleep. And they awaken in the appropriate resurrection. Are they aware of the time in between? To them, it's just a brief interruption in life. And they are, they are resurrected at the end. This time, we know the truth about death. And we're ready to see God for the first time in the history of the universe leave Satan and his followers to reap the natural results of their sin. And they will die. But we've seen death. We understand about death. And we will not misunderstand the death of the wicked in the end. And we will not serve God from fear for eternity. And that's why I believe everyone has to understand this before the wicked die in the end. Think of it meaning so much to God that he would even resurrect the wicked. Who would suffer more than God seeing all his children resurrected? The wicked ones. 
I mean, why would he do that, who's so infinitely gracious? Why would he do this? The price must be worth it. It must be apparent to the whole family that God is not the one who takes any one of his children's eternal life away. He does not do that. He never said, obey me or I'll kill you. We do not live with that kind of a God. Or if you disobey me, I'll discipline you. Well, there's a lot of that in scripture. But is, do, you discipline, do you discipline your children because you hate them? Do you discipline them to the point of destruction? Does it do any good to kill your son and say, I hope that's taught you a lesson? It won't do any good. That's not discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. The death at the end is no discipline. It is the inevitable and awful consequence of God leaving his children to reap the natural results of their own rebellious choice. And if we have any doubts about it at that time, we now can watch the wicked die as the angels watch Jesus die. We didn't watch that. We read about it. The universe watched, got the message. In the end, we will watch the wicked die and we can look in the face of Jesus, still in his human form. And how do you think he will look? And he'll be crying, Hosea 11 and all these other places. And if we don't feel the same way, a mistake was made in letting us in. We'll all feel that way. How can we give you up? How can we let you go? But we know it leads to death. We cannot live alone in this universe. It's one thing I would know for sure at stake my whole life on it, if this isn't so, we've got the wrong God. That has to be a natural consequence. When God unveils his life-giving glory, the glory of him who is love will consume. Those are out of harmony. And it's no ordinary fire, apparently. And some live longer in it than others. And Lucifer, who used to walk in the presence of God, remember Isaiah and Ezekiel? He walked among those stones of fire. He's lived in that life-giving glory. He lives longer in it. I believe if it was execution, God would put them to sleep right now. He'd practice euthanasia if God were executing. That's evidence that he's not. He's simply leaving people to reap the natural and inevitable consequences of their own rebellious choice. Actually, what we're discussing tonight, I think, affects one's relationship with God maybe more than anything else.